Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really great guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow. Um, we're going to be getting some really exciting topics, some really convergent themes. Um, today, we have the, the honor of being joined by Dr. Mark Bailey, who is the department chair uh, of cyber intelligence and data science at the Edinger School of Science and Technology Intelligence and co-director of the Data Science Intelligence Center at the National Intelligence University, uh, which is a, a federally chartered research university. It's located in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, operated by and for the United States intelligence community as its sort of staff college of higher learning in various fields related to the profession of intelligence and national security. Uh, and the, uh, the Anthony Ettinger School of Science and Technology Intelligence, of course, prepares students for careers specifically uh, focused in those domains. Uh, prior to this role, Dr. Bailey has served in a variety of really fascinating roles uh, in the United States Department of Defense, the intelligence community, also the State Department, uh, including uh, roles like uh, as a biochemical intelligence analyst and medical support officer uh, in the United States Army Reserve, where he also currently has the title of major. Uh, he was a chemical and biologic foreign policy advisor at the United States State Department, a department chief at USAMRID, as well as a, a chemical engineer uh, at NIST, uh, the National National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Uh, Dr. Bailey um, got his, his master's in science and technology intelligence from NIU, uh, but he also has uh, undergraduate degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering uh, from University of Pittsburgh, uh, also a master's in chemical engineering and his PhD uh, in bioengineering from the University of Kansas. A lot of really interesting topics and themes to get into today. Uh, we're honored to have him with us today. Uh, Dr. Mark Bailey, thanks so much for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It, um, it, it, please. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I know you, you You might have a uh, uh, a, uh, a statement to read prior to, to our episode, so please uh, take sure the time thing. to do that. Yeah. I just wanted to caveat that any, you know, any opinions expressed on this episode are my individual thoughts. And they don't necessarily reflect those of ODNI or the intelligence community or, or NIU. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it, it's great having you, Mark. Um, you know, I, you've been on an amazing journey. I, I'd love to start off at the beginning because, you know, as I typically do, I, I sort of delve into the, the amazing sort of publication histories of our guests. And yours is no exception here. Uh, you started off, you know, doing your master's work in, in the area of, uh, of, of chondrocyte regeneration and umbilical stem cells. You went into your PhD working on uh, pulmonary drug delivery. Take us back to the early days. What got you interested in chemical engineering? What got you interested in bioengineering? And a little bit of these early days. I think that would be a great way to start things off. Yeah, absolutely. So when I went to college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew that I liked chemistry, biology, and math. So I decided to focus on engineering. So I majored in chemical engineering uh, with a minor in bioengineering. Did some undergraduate research. Uh, the paper that you that you referenced on the uh, mesenchymal stem cells was uh, that was done as an REU student. Um, so I had the privilege of being a, a, a REU is a, an NSF funded program for undergraduate students to do research at other universities. So I had the opportunity to uh, to spend a summer at the University of Kansas and work with uh, Dr. Michael Dedimore, who was a fantastic advisor for an undergraduate student and for grad students. Uh, doing that kind of work, and it led to a publication uh, in the area of tissue engineering. Um, that's what really made me fall in love with the University of Kansas, and that's why I ended up going there for, for grad school. Uh, and when I was a grad student there, I worked with Dr. Corey Berkland, uh, doing a lot of work on 
uh, aerosols, so aerosol drug delivery, uh, and then also some other work on on nanotechnology related to to um, to uh, like bioengineering type applications. So it was, it's been a really fascinating journey. Um, you know, I think the undergraduate research experience is what really sparked my uh, my interest in, in pursuing research uh, and higher education in in the area of bioengineering. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. Excellent. And, you know, you're following your, your PhD, um, you, as you know, I mentioned in the bio, uh, you begin this early career journey across, you know, various uh, sort of innovation ecosystems within our government, places like NIST, USAMRI, the Department of State. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a theme that sort of comes into your research at this point, looking at uh, countermeasure development, sort of the whole area of, uh, of CBRN sciences, which we touched on a bit on the show. Uh, you begin publishing on themes like, uh, uh, ultimately, how to degrade uh, organophosphate nerve agents like sarin and VX and, and nasty stuff like that, which we we spent a little time with uh, Colonel Chris Grice a couple weeks ago talking about uh, their process of, of destroying things at the Pueblo Depot. Uh, you, you, you published on really, I, I didn't even heard of uh, uh, Burkholderia pseudomalli, which uh, interesting gram negative uh, bacteria that the CDC classifies as a bioterrorism agent. Um, talk a little bit about these days, because again, it's a, a fascinating segue. Way to to what you were studying in uh, undergrad, and of course your PhD, and into some of these important topics for our national security. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I had the opportunity to work as a, an NSF postdoc at NIST. Uh, then after the postdoc, I I went to uh, I, I I assessed into the Army as a biochemist, um, and then I was at USAMRID for a while, and I, that's where I was the uh, uh, the uh, chief of aerosol technology. So we helped develop. Uh, novel systems for aerosol challenge, uh, and also for testing aerosolized uh, therapeutic interventions against different types of biothreat agents. And that's where the Burkholderia uh, paper came into play. So we did a lot of work trying to aerosolize different types of antibiotics or ceftazidine in this place, or in this uh, instance, uh, to to treat to treat um, uh, pulmonary Burkholderia infection. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, the segue then occurs again. Uh, you um, arrive at National Intelligence University. Well, as, as I mentioned, you you do a master's uh, at NIU. Um, your responsibilities ultimately lead to, you know, as we, as I again, I mentioned in uh, in the bio, in terms of your leading the the department per cyber intelligence and data sciences. But before we get there, um, I'd love to sort of sort of just do a little reintroduction for the audience because the last time we talked about uh, NIU uh, was was a couple of years ago. Now we, we met up with Brian Holmes, uh, talking a little bit about the organization, sort of where it is, what it's all about. Take us. It's sort of a reintroduction to the organization a bit because it's something that I, I I don't think a lot of people would be as familiar with if we didn't see the Brian's episode, but that was a couple of years ago. Introduce us to NIU, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So NIU is the National Intelligence University. Uh, like you said, we're sort of like the staff university for the intelligence community. Uh, so our students are all members of the IC uh, or military uh, members of the IC. Uh, and we have two master's programs. So there's a master's in science and technology intelligence, which has more of a tech focus. And then there's a master's of strategic intelligence, which is more of a, a strategy focus. Uh, we have myriad concentrations in a lot of different areas. Um, the School of Science and Technology Intelligence is uh, where, I, where I'm the department chair for cyber intelligence and data science. Um, and we try to enculturate this idea in our students of how you can, how you can use technology in a way that gives you decision advantage. So how can the IC leverage technology developments um, <clears throat> and understand technology trends and, and their impacts on national security? Um, NIU is kind of, sometimes a lot of people don't understand sort of how NIU fits into a larger sort of educational, uh, you know, educational scheme, especially a lot of my colleagues in academia who are at, um, you know, other universities. And I often use the analogy of like a, <clears throat> a West Point, even though it's kind of a loose analogy, it's almost like a service academy because it's run by the government for government employees, but it is an accredited university. So it, our mission is different than like a training institution where, you know, we provide a, an education. So we don't necessarily teach our students what to think about certain types of things, but we teach them how to think and how to uh, be creative thinkers within the IC. 
And along that way, you started thinking creatively. And I would love to hear, you know, before, once again, we get to your current role, um, how you made the jump. Uh, you were thinking of mesenchymal stem cells and pulmonary drug delivery and, and nasty bioterrorism agents. What got you interested in cyber and data science and some of the uh, disciplines that you teach, write, and lecture about nowadays? Yeah, for sure. I get that question a lot. Um, I always sort of start that out with most of the data scientists that I know never started by studying data science. I know a lot of data scientists who, who studied bioinformatics, engineering, or other types of fields that are, you know, tangentially related to data science, but and have skill and teach you skills that are leverageable in data science, but no one really studies data science strictly. Or, I mean, that's sort of changing now, but um, in the past when I became a data scientist, that was sort of the, um, that was kind of the rule. So when I left active duty army, I kind of decided to pivot a little bit from the Seaburn space. I got really interested in data science and, and some of the, uh, you know, some of the implications thereof when I was at NIU as a student. Um, so when I left active duty, I went and sort of became a data scientist at a, a few different IC agencies. Um, you know, being an engineer, uh, being able to code and do math, like it's, it's not, they're a very fungible skill set. So it's easy to sort of translate into doing a lot of the data science work and just kind of learning the new, uh, the new language on my own and learning how to, how to navigate that space, learning about AI and all of that stuff. So after being a data scientist on a few different IC uh, projects, I, I ended up going back to NIU as a faculty member. Um, and then along with uh, Tom Pike, the current Dean, we established the data science concentration um, and while Brian Holmes was still there, we sort of separated the, the data science concentration from the cyber intelligence concentration. So now they're two separate ones. And we kind of built all the courses uh, around that. Excellent. Let's, um, let's head into some, because you've, uh, again, you've been publishing um, peer-reviewed literature and, and also these, uh, you know, National In uh, Intelligence University has a variety of these, these research publications. And it's very interesting. Um, uh, because it, it, you publish much more, not you, but the organization publishes on a range of topics. And, I, and for everyone listening and watching, I, I recommend you go to the website of NIU and look at some of these. I mean, there's topics, everything from sort of the history of war to climate change and, and everything in between. Um, I, I'd love to start off with a, uh, a National Intelligence University research short that you wrote recently uh, entitled Understanding and Mitigating the Long-Term Risks of AI for the Operationalization obviously AI an extremely hot topic <laughs> in most quarters nowadays uh, in this particular um, uh, short you you know you highlight some of the sort of the core uh, thinking that you impart upon the intelligence community when we're dealing with these new AI systems that you know at the end of the day uh, we need to be able to explain these systems uh, they need to be ethical and we got to be able to control them um, obviously core core themes uh, before we go any further in the AI space. Take us a little bit into this uh, NIU short, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of this work started um, with one of my former students, uh, a very talented student, Kyle Killian, who's at NGA, was very interested in AI safety and did a lot of work in this area. I published a little bit uh, on this in this field, and I was really interested in the AI safety component and was building an AI safety course at NIU at this time. Uh, but then his paper ended up becoming, or his thesis was eventually published in Futures. It just came out like last week. Um, and then I was, I also collaborate a lot with uh, Dr. Susan Schneider from the Florida Atlantic University on this topic. So she's a philosopher. Uh, she's also the director for the Center of Future Mind, and she studies a lot of these issues related to uh, a gentle behavior in AI systems. Um, so this paper sort of uh, the NIU short that you reference uh, sort of culminates on a lot of these topics that I've been working on uh, and sort of what I like to characterize as a gentle risk with AI. Um, AI is kind of like it's even if we never achieve what you know what is called AGI or artificial general intelligence, AI is still unpredictable in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, you're still dealing with an intelligent agent that is in effect alien from the way humans think about certain types of topics or, or certain types of things. And so when you rely on AI for certain types of decision making, there's a lot of risk involved in that. And that you know is all stemming from what they call the alignment problem, which is the idea that you can't necessarily ensure that AI decision making is aligned with human decision making or human values. Mm -hmm. Also the explainability problem where AI is effectively a black box and you can't 
you can't rationalize this behavior by looking at a bunch of weights and biases that are associated with like a neural network or something like that. You know, a human can post hoc rationalize their behavior and explain why they made a, de a decision that they did, but you can't necessarily ask an AI to do the same thing. Um, and then also control. So if you have AI that becomes more and more capable, how do you ensure that humans can maintain control over those types of systems? And I think that as we continue to leverage AI across the IC and the DOD for any number of applications, we have to keep these sorts of um, these sorts of agental risks in mind uh, and sort of try and work on mitigating those and, and building some sort of international consensus on how we ought to mitigate those risks before we you know sort of dive into the deep end when it comes to AI integration. And, and continuing along those themes, you know, you also wrote the uh, perspective piece, why strong artificial intelligence weapons should be considered uh, weapons of mass destruction. And here, you know, you sort of you take us into sort of the, the, the science fiction dystopia, you know, stuff that people like to talk about, uh, but then bring us back to look, you know, um, these are important discussions that need to be had. You know, we, we've had, again, people on the show like uh, Admiral Selby at the Office of Naval Research and uh, Brett Vaughn is their AI folks and, and a bunch of other people, you know, really talk about this concept of, you know, AI sort of on the line, all, you know, all these themes. Um, and, and, you know, you make a point here, we really got to, you know, consider um, when we talk about kinetic versus non-kinetic operations uh that this malignant failure thing well, you know although it's probably not gonna be terminator style stuff we, we got to keep it in mind talk a little bit about this paper what strong ai means uh, and a little bit of how you uh teach uh this particular theme at niu absolutely so i have a class that i teach at niu called algorithm algorithmic warfare and we focus on ai safety and and we look at AI in the context of things like lethal autonomous weapons um, and other applications that could potentially, you know, fail deadly in the event that they fail. Um, so we kind of take a, a complex systems approach to looking at AI. Um, again, it's kind of like this, uh, you know, it, we look at it more of like an AI mega system and how these different AI systems interact with each other and could potentially cause cascading failure modes throughout a lot of these types of environments. Um, it's not, we don't necessarily think that we're going to have like a you know, a Terminator type scenario where you have some singleton AI like Skynet kind of taking over and all of that. But it's more all of these, you know, these decision making systems, these optimizers that, mm -hmm. you know, think way differently than the way humans think about certain problems, all interacting with each other, leading to unpredictable outcomes. Um, that was kind of the theme of the, the paper that you mentioned, uh, the one that was from Homeland Security Today, the perspective on strong AI. Yeah. Um, the way we define strong AI is, you know, it's, it, it, I guess it's it's really defined as AGI, so artificial general intelligence, but we're kind of looking at anything that, um, anything between weak AI and strong AI. So we're kind of, even if we never achieve AGI, a lot of these rules still apply to these systems as they become more generalizable uh, and more capable. So it's kind of, it's more of a continuous spectrum as opposed to a discrete uh, categories of, of weak mm -hmm. versus strong AI. And one other, um uh piece that i uh, personally found extremely fascinating again you know i have i, I have limited a, a scope to digest all this but in your paper uh examining the differential risk from high level ai and the question of control um you know you again you're talking about sort of the, this complexity you know understanding how uh, things could go wrong. And in this particular paper, I was uh, there's this interesting uh, graph that you show uh, where you basically bring all of you know all these different dimensions of of the issues that you got to take into account. Like I like uh, I, I compared it to a sort of a systems biology state space graph. Um, a lot of things that go on biology, we don't know what always ultimately will lead to what. Same thing here, uh, and you have this amazing graph. And then one of the things you talk about is that you know uh, we may require uh, more advanced technologies to really understand these interactions in the future. You bring up topics like quantum computing in this paper. Um, do, 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 are you teaching much about quantum now? I mean, quantum is kind of a hot topic. I know we're sort of uh, still in sort of the embryonic era of quantum. We're, we're in this, uh, we're not in the really the era of true quantum computing yet, but um, any interesting insights about sort of the computational side of this and some of the tools that we're gonna have to get pretty good at in understanding uh, these complex system AI interactions? Yeah, absolutely. So I won't claim to be an expert on quantum computing. 
um, when we referenced it in that paper, it was more looking at quantum computing as being an enabling technology when it comes to AI development. And I think as, as quantum computing advances, AI is going to continue to advance and leverage a lot of the developments within quantum computing to become more capable. Um, it's certainly an interesting topic. Um, we have a lot of, we have, do have some quantum computing experts at, at NIU that I talk to a lot about this topic. And, um, you know, but I, I, like I said, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in quantum computing, but I do see it as an enabling force when it comes to AI development. Awesome. Uh, Mark, you um, you had a fascinating article recently, uh, just a couple of days ago, actually, in Nautilus magazine, uh, along with Dr. Susan Schneider. It was entitled, AI Shouldn't Decide What's True. Uh, experts on trusting artificial intelligence to, to give us the truth is a foolish bargain. Uh, talk a little bit ab about this piece, because I think it's very, very recent and very relevant to the discussion that's going on in the public sphere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Susan and I, uh, you know, we're concerned about AI in terms of its decision making, like I mentioned, um, you know, and one of the issues with with a lot of AI decision making types of systems or, or large language models is that they basically interpolate human language. So they learn to, you know, effectively be creative in terms of by by learning from their training set. So one of the things that occurs with that is that you have bias that's injected based on the training set. So if you have a certain training set that you know, encompasses a certain body of knowledge that may be biased in a particular way, then the AI is going to make, you know, interpretations or decisions that are based on that. And that becomes dangerous when you start to rely on AI systems as being arbiters of truth. So as these large language models like GPT become more ubiquitous and people interact with them more, you know, there's a chance that they could be used by nefarious actors to, number one, potentially spread disinformation because you now train this, this language model, this that has that exhibits certain types of potentially a gentle behavior that now only thinks within the scope of the training data set that it has, you know. So you, that could be leveraged by, um, you know, by by someone who wants to spread disinformation within a, a an autocratic regime, uh, or also someone who wants to sow political disinformation in some context. So, you know, that the article sort of argues that you know we need to be very wary of these types of systems. And we need to figure out, you know, how do we define ground truth when it comes to developing these types of uh, these types of models if we're going to rely on them for for this type of information. Excellent, excellent. Um, one more paper, and I and 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 this one um, obviously got a lot of people talking. Um, recent preprint: Could AI be the great filter? What astrobiology can teach the intelligence community uh, about anthropogenic risks? Uh, and, and here, you know, you introduce the the reader to the the Fermi paradox about you know we got a lot of stars and planets and other stuff out there. There should be life out there. We're not running into it. Um, did did climate change do them in? Did nuclear war do them in? You take us into the world of AI and potentially, uh, it, what, what, could AI be one of these filters that Fermi, <laughs> uh, about the paradox? Um, talk us, talk through this, uh, this preprint a little bit because I, especially in the last couple of days, you know, uh, there's, there's been a little chatter going on about what's out there, but, um, t take us into this paper if you would, Mark. Totally. Yeah. I'm, so this is more of a speculative, a, a very speculative piece. Um, as I think, you know, I was thinking a lot about, um, catastrophic risk and and looking at astrobiology in terms of how yeah. ast astrobiologists tend to analyze risk. Um, and I think, you know, we we tend to suffer from what uh, I think this was coined by um, Eliezer Yudkowsky, this idea of non-extensional reasoning when it comes to analyzing risk that relates to things as devastating as human extinction. Yeah. So the idea is that you know, if you have, everyone can sort of understand the risk associated with a loved one who's suffering from a terminal illness and what the what the natural outcome of that is going to be. And they respond a certain way to that. But when you think about something like human extinction, where the outcome is the same, people don't think about it in terms of, you know, what the what the outcome is going to be. They just think of it as like, oh, it's it's something that's so far, so far ahead into the future, or it's something very science fiction. -y. So no one really, I think, appreciates the idea of, uh, catastrophic risk the way that they would other types of risk, even when the outcomes are the same. And so this is sort of a, a cognitive bias that we tend to inject into this sort of analysis. And, you know, astrobiology gives you certain tools to kind of overcome that bias. Uh, not only that, but also, you know, sort of the um, anthropic biases that we inject into trying to understand global catastrophic risk from things like an asteroid impact. So if you do sort of an um, 
10 a posteriori analysis and under and try and look and see look and find evidence of uh you know an extinguishing event that occurred where an asteroid hit the planet um you're not likely to find an event that led to human extinction because humans exist so we're not going to find evidence of an asteroid impact that led to human extinction therefore it's hard for us to assess the probability of that happening so you have to take more of an a priori type of approach <clears throat> excuse me where you try to examine the probability of any sort of large you know extinguishing type of event occurring and <clears throat> i feel like you know maybe the ic does needs to take a a different type of approach to analyzing global catastrophic risk because um you know this could potentially be a problem um <clears throat> and so the whole idea of the fermi paradox is that you know if if life is so prevalent in the universe why haven't we discovered it and so one potential solution to that is this great filter where at some point during life during intelligent life's development uh, there's some sort of catastrophic event that wipes it out. So it could be something early in life's uh, genesis. So something like, you know, maybe the probability of abiogenesis occurring is very, very low. And that's sort of that that bottleneck step. And so that's why we don't really see any anyone happen, any, you know, any other intelligent species in the, on, in the universe. And then further along in that progression, you have things that would be considered anthropogenic. So maybe some intelligent uh, agent does evolve, and it is a common thing to for them to evolve, but they end up wiping themselves out for some reason, either through nuclear war or through, you know, any any sort of you know catastrophic risk that you could think of. One of which may potentially be AI. So if something invents something that is as intelligent as that species and then ends up replacing them in in their ecological niche, you know that could be one reason why we don't see any evidence of of you know biological. Um, you know, other biological species in the universe. Um, I think, you know, and we can look for astrobiological evidence to support, you know, which one of these things within could potentially be a candidate for the great filter. So, you know, if we're if we discover uh, bacterial type life on Europa or something like that, then that would suggest that maybe abiogenesis is more common and therefore that's probably not the great filter. Or if we discover, you know, in the event that we discover some extraterrestrial type signal uh, and it comes from something that is, uh, not biological, then that might suggest, okay, well, if we're not seeing any evidence of biological life, then perhaps it was displaced by something that's artificial. And so either maybe that was by design, or maybe it was something that, you know, in a devastating way wiped out that species. Mm -hmm. So again, the paper is very speculative, but I think it's an interesting problem to sort of think about and examine, and it might sort of give us pause in terms of how we analyze these types of catastrophic risks. Yeah, and I, th I think that's, um... I think that's really awesome. And I think it just goes to, once again, it goes to the uh, sort of the story that, uh, you know, what, what you are capable of, of thinking about and, and sort of, you know, the uh, moonshot thinking that uh, you're allowed to do at NIU. And uh, it, it's just, you know, again, it it, uh, it got a lot of press and um, it was just very intriguing. And I thought it's just an interesting part of uh, your story and, and how you get to think about stuff in, on a daily basis. So I, you know, I cheer you on for that. Um, <laughs> what, what um, you know, you know, here I am. You know, I'm talking to a, an, an expert in, in bioengineering and chemical engineering. You, you now are uh, an expert in all things cyber and data sciences. Um, I'd like to loop back a bit now and just sort of connect them because you know these themes um, we're finding connections all over the place lately. You know, several of the guests that I had, like you know our friends at IARPA and the Jake at the Pentagon and so forth, you know, are, are merging uh, in different disciplines the themes of uh, the bio sciences and, and 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 sort of the information sciences information technology what gets you excited when, when you look at sort of the experience that you've had on both fronts uh whether we're talking about things like you know the biosurveillance tools uh for, for pandemic prevention that, that iarp is working on um things like artificial intelligence we're using it a lot nowadays to discover new drugs potentially uh you know thinking back to your work in countermeasure development you know how we can develop new agents to protect us from from those nasty things what what gets you excited sort of uh, when you look at the intersection of these two domains in 2023 and, and looking out a little bit? I think AI is going to be a significant enabling technology, uh, you know, in, in this field, especially within biosurveillance and, and other things that you just mentioned. Um, you know, I, we already see AI being used for uh, proteomics work, trying to find, um, you know, novel active sites and different enzymes for, for different potential drugs. 
Um, I think there's also a danger associated with that because if you can use it to find a therapeutic agent, you could also theoretically use it to find something that is a toxin uh, or something bad. Um, so I think, you know, there's, it, it, it comes, you know, there's going to be, AI is going to be a significant benefit for humanity, but all, it also comes with significant risk. Um, so, you know, I'm excited about the potential, but I'm also very, uh, you know, worried about some of the potential negative applications. Mm -hmm. Mark, what, um, what makes a, um, I'd say a, a good candidate for NIU. I, I, you know, I talk to my uh, kids about, uh, and they're sort of all around college age now, uh, about uh, the guests I have on the show. And I was explaining NIU to them. And they're like, well, that's cool. I wanna, I'm going to apply. I'm like, you can't do that yet. Uh, there's <laughs> there's some things that have to happen first. But um, you know, clearly, you're you're an, a bioengineer that became great at, uh, at cyber and data sciences. Um, any interesting you know, stories about, you know, it, Hey, you know, does uh, an artist or a musician or you know some other interesting discipline make for a great intelligence student? Uh, per the uh, you know the, the work that you do at NIU, any any interesting sort of fun facts, stories along those lines per people that may be listening that hey, I would I would apply to NIU someday uh, and do some of this stuff as well. Yeah, I think NIU is a a great place to explore a, a lot of different types of things. So as long as you're intellectually curious. Um, you know, I think you'll be very successful there. I have a lot of students who come into the data science curriculum at NIU, and they, they've never coded in their life. Um, but they're really interested in learning about AI. They're interested in learning about data science or cyber. Um, and they excel. They do really great. They learn how, by the end of their time at NIU, they learn how to code. They learn how to, uh, you know, build, you know, different types of AI models. They learn about AI safety and all of that. Um, and I think they leave NIU and now they have sort of a different perspective on different types of things. Um, so they can leverage their, whatever their skill set is that they come in with, uh, you know, into, into expanding their, their horizon into a lot of different ways. Um, and I know that happens in other areas at NIU too. So, you know, I came to NIU not really knowing anything about cyber um, or data science, you know, for that matter. But then, you know, I left having a better appreciation for, uh, for both of those different areas and, and being able to see connections between my my bioengineering background and and these other areas uh, so i think that's that's the greatest benefit for niu like i said earlier it teaches you not what to think but how to think about different types of things and i think that's important for the ic as we move forward and uh and you know continue to be competitive globally i mean we we want people who are able to think outside the box um and so we can avoid intelligence failures and other types of things you know you have to have uh, you know, you have to have creative thinkers within the IC in order to avoid those types of, of scenarios. Excellent. Uh, and then just, you know, while we have you, Mark, I, you know, obviously, you know, you, you do, uh, you have multiple responsibilities at NIU, you, you obviously do some public facing stuff like with our show. I noticed uh, a couple of months ago, you were at this interesting MindFest conference uh, in, in Boca Raton talking about all sorts of other cool things like global brains and, and networks and, and, and things like that. Um, anything else coming up for 2023, sort of in the public facing stuff, uh, places that you're going to be speaking, uh, conferences, places we could listen to you, possibly meet you, uh, anything else that's hot on your calendar that you can mention, please kind of take the floor. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to the Effective Altruism Conference in October. Um, so the EA group there. Uh, you know, they, they're very interested in, in things like a gentle risk when it comes to AI. So I'm curious to meet some other folks there who are working in that space. Um, some of the people that I met at the MindFest conference in Boca Raton are going to be there. Um, the, the MindFest group is a great, uh, well, the Center for the Future Mind is a really interesting sort of collaborative uh, organization of people. Like I said, it's uh, the director is uh, Susan Schneider from FAU. Yep. Um, you know, she's a philosopher of mind. She studies things like consciousness and and agental behavior in AI. Uh, and she's also studied astrobiology. So she's done a lot of really cool, interesting things as well. And so she brings together a lot of people from who are multidisciplinary. So everyone from philosophers to uh, astrophysicists, computer scientists, and others to talk about a lot of these issues. Um, so the MindFest conference was interesting because it focused a lot on, you know, sort of the nature of consciousness, but also, um, you know, what it means for an AI to have a mind and and sort of the risks associated with that. Um, and also some issues, you know, in the event that, you know, AGI is achieved and you have 
uh, you know, an AI that potentially would have consciousness if we're able to really fully define what that means for a machine, you know, there may be some ethical considerations there. So how do you ethically treat something like that? Um, you know, the way we usually attribute moral value to a living thing is sort of its degree of consciousness. So how does that apply to a machine? So these are very like, you know, forward thinking types of things for uh, scenarios that we haven't achieved yet, but it's interesting to think about these topics. Um, so I, I'm, those are the types of things that really excite me and I'm looking forward to engaging with that group in the future and also, you know, some of the other folks who, who are working in that space. Yeah, it was, I, I, I noticed at that conference there was, a, there was a talk given about what it's like to be an octopus. And we actually, yeah. <laughs> we talked about octopus intelligence on the show a couple months ago. So that, that, was, that was equally intriguing. But no, it's, um, it's fascinating work, Mark. I mean, I, mean, I just, um, again, I love doing, uh, as I mentioned, these convergent themes and, and seeing how uh, folks like you that, you know, uh, you know, start out one discipline, end up somewhere else, and just you know, are are expert, become experts at everything, and in and just from a perspective of advancing science and technology, national security, of course, I, I just take my hat off to you, and just really, it's so impressive. I, I wish you the best as you continue in these multiple roles and and thinking about these. Uh, these issues at, at, at this very unique level. Um, any any final messages while we have you? Anything that I missed? Uh, messages to the audience, uh, next generation people thinking about uh, the steps in their career. Any, anything else that I, I didn't touch on, please, uh, you can take us out. Um, yeah, I mean, just stay curious about things, I think is sort of the takeaway. Um, that's the one thing I love about NIU is that it, it encourages you to be curious about different types of topics and gives you the academic freedom to explore a lot of different types of things. Uh, that's the key takeaway is just continue to be curious about different types of things and, and understand that there are a lot of different connections between you know things that maybe you've done in the past and, and new potential things in the future uh, and learn to leverage that skill set uh, in different ways. You know, I think having a having a biology background or being someone who is um, you know, biology adjacent gives me a different perspective on AI than maybe someone who came out of computer science. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Excellent message. Excellent message. Um, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular of our episode uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, again, you've been listening to Do well, Major Dr. Mark Bailey, Department Chair, Cyber Intelligence and Data Sciences, Editor School of Science and Technology Intelligence, Co-Director, Data Science Intelligence Center at our National Intelligence University. Uh, Mark, I, I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while about your amazing journey Journey, everything you're up to. Obviously, thank you for what you do to protect the United States and, and, and keep us safe. Uh, and as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, via the, the continued development of these disciplines through your teaching. Uh, really, really great story. It was great having you. Thank you, Ira. It's been a pleasure.